You have just said that disruptive developments are occurring in matters of religion. Would you please elucidate your observation? In India, people are by nature religious minded. Their deep feelings of devotion and regard and faith are being exploited for self-interest in a distorted religiosity. That very practice came to be branded as a disruptive development. This is nothing but playing upon sentiment. Some tricky persons proclaim to be godly virtuous with the pretension of a super guru. Then with the help of a number of simple-minded devotees proceed with an acquisitive plan for amassing fortune and fame. Internal arrangement of distribution of the collection goes on operating well while the game goes on in the name of religion. Certain supernatural incidents are shown off for make-believe purpose and thereby attract and enroll new devotees and disciples. Even agents on commission basis are being deployed by certain sects. This is preposterous. Another novel way of self-propagation is the postcard system now in vogue. A card comes to you with a request to make nine copies of the text recommending a certain monk and send by post to nine acquaintances. Good fortune assured if it is complied and a threat of misfortune if not done. Common men are so steeped in superstition that they don't dare not to carry out the task. This is a clear instance of applying mental threat or force in the name of religion. Such perversions are in fact abnormal practices, nothing but an ignoble act of business by postcard to benefit certain gurus engaged in penance somewhere. Things are worse in places of worship and pilgrimage. Taking advantage of the people's blind faith on superstition or hope of heavenly bliss, rampant businesses prospering in the name of religion. Innumerable instances of such deplorable things are known to me, which I can cite for the sake of exposure. Everyone has deep regards and emotional sentiment towards their parents. This increases manifold after their demise. Undoubtedly, there are even now genuine saints and monks who deserve adoration for their commitment to the Shastras, Vedas and to their country. But now they are also in the shade as they try to shout and caution people against the tomfoolery being perpetuated so rampantly. Even they are branded by ignorant demagogues as another form of exploitation in the name of religion. In fact, our country is now dominated by lion cubs reduced to lambs. As the story goes, a ruler somewhere got hold of two strangers as captives for ritual beheading. The two were kept in a cell awaiting the king's man to come in the morning and drag out one of them to the gallows. They had night-long discussions and plans how to escape. When at last the escort arrived in the morning, he found the two quarreling at high pitch, even claimed to be beheaded on the very same day. Their incessant dispute was reported to the ruler who came running to the spot. He asked for an explanation from them. They impressed him by telling that both came to know in their dream last night that it was an auspicious occasion to be beheaded, whereby one was certain to go to heaven and attain perpetual bliss. The king was so moved that he decided to attain heavenly bliss and fortune by self-sacrifice. So he took ablution, changed dress and went along for the sacrificial beheading. Look, this is our land and the sense and sentiment of the people. Maybe they are very simple. 
They believe in whatever is projected before them by the so-called religious leaders. In fact, however, they are unsuspecting idiots. They can't differentiate between what is genuine and what is mere hoax. Actual profit and gains go to those leaders' benefits and the commoners turn into a class of beggars. Certain commendable terms we get in the Vedas, like ashram, saint, monk, noble, liberal, etc. But these are never meant to address any individual, nor any place of worship, nor any particular object as such. These attributes are applicable to deserving persons and holy places only. Take for instance the term ashram. In the Veda, the word means a place which provides shelter to the needy and for that matter, even our parents also are like shelter and ashram for us. The word mandir or temple signifies the doorway to the inner self. Man's worldly life is just like that, a place for the exposure of our inner self. Whoever lives a life of integrity and honesty is attributed as the sannyasi, say, a mendicant ascetic. For them, there won't be any need for clothing or sandal pastes on the face and forehead. Transparency in the living style was enough for accreditation of a sannyasin. Virtues only were recognized, not the assumed postures. In case of self-abnegation or renouncing of self-interest too, the real test is the firm determination to distribute all possessions for the welfare of those who are really needy. But in many cases, people show off as donors but keep self-interest intact. But they can't be recognized as genuine abnegators and donors. A mother would be always regarded by her children as a selfless well-wisher. Parents don't hesitate to lay down their lives for the good of their offspring. That too, not for duty's sake, but solely for their own satisfaction and bliss. This is the characteristic feature of a yogin. This is the way to serve the whole mankind, keeping their welfare in mind, not own selfish aim. Such persons are ideal for the nation. They only deserve the attribute, like saint or forsaker of self, or a true humanitarian. You may argue that parental affection will never be the same for children of other families or other relatives. It is a fact that the percentage of love and affection will differ from case to case, but it will be prudent and wise to feel equally concerned for all. You will understand it better from the example of our old-time joint family system. The same arrangement for cooking food for all members of the family and no differentiation while making distribution. Again, there will be no scope for abuse or adulteration, for that will harm all in the same way. So it is desirable that unbiased affection and care for all in the society be the culture of our people. That will resolve all the social problems and inhibitions. We find such indications in the Vedas also where it has been advised that all resources and food crops be collected together instead of individual ownership and then let people partake of it according to their needs respectively. Adulteration or cheating will be checked automatically because if any mischief is done, that will affect all unsparingly. By natural instinct, man wants self-security. None will agree to lay down life unnecessarily. The whole empire of life insurance business was built up on this concept only. The life insurance operators take the risk of huge payment of claims 
in lieu of nominal premium? Do they send observers to ensure the security of the clients? No, because they know that every man will strive to save his own life. This illustrates the tendency of man to confine his self within own limited sphere. If this circle of self-confinement be extended to wider areas, then more and more elements will come into one's limited orbit. When you think of yours own self-interest alone, your own family members only will get your love and caressing. But the circle of self can be spread to cover the entire village so that all others become the object of your love. Then you consider yourself as a Bengali and think for their welfare only. As you proceed, you extend the area of coverage to entire India as your own area of service to the people. You will then feel all Indians are your dear relatives. Extend your area much further up to the planetary system. When you are at that height, being a son of this world, you naturally develop a sense of relationship with the whole universe. Thus, when all are bound by the spirit of unison with each other, all sorts of problems arising out of selfishness will be dissolved automatically. This is not at all unpracticable, I think, for it is verily a natural course of affairs. Nowadays, we find chaos all around, in fact, that is all unnatural. A lot of degradation has befallen our performing religion and practices. Here is an instance. Devotees proceed singing devotional songs. Those in the front utter the verses correct in words and tune. But people who are in the rear go on repeating wrong verses that would appear sarcastic. All newcomers who join the tail end of the procession become enthralled by what is being shouted by others ahead of them so that to sing the hymns in mistaken terms and tunes it never occurs to them that the verses they are shouting are meaningless and absurd. When by chance a few amongst them find that it was nothing but fun they leave the procession in disgust. Many people in our society now feel frustrated and suspicious, even over mentioning of religion. To many of them, religion is mere bigotry and fallacious idiocy. But the truth has to be salvaged and re-established. This is the social responsibility of those who are initiated. Specialists and experienced persons in different branches of the faith will be more credible and acceptable to the people. Ordinary practitioners speak generally on their own line of imagination and perception. I am adept in this line. I therefore preach with conviction that genuine religion is nothing to be afraid of. It is not a mere imagery, nor something immaterial or unsubstantial. Religion as it appears today is merely the perverted shape to which it has been reduced by abuse. When people are enamored of the perverted shape of true religion, the essential aspect easily escapes notice. Those of you who feel that the practices in vogue are not genuine, when a query must arise about fundamental truth, wherever a shade, there must be some object you must be in search of the light. If you retreat just because of the shade, then you will be depriving yourself of the light.